there's people who like kids, people who don't like kids, and then there's people who work with kids. Teachers, camp counselors, coaches, and everything in between are all undervalued and underappreciated. And that's because it takes a certain type of person to spend your life working with kids. And I'm sure anyone who's changed a diaper or dealt with a tantrum can definitely tell you that. However, it's rewarding, playful, eye-opening, and a great way to stay in touch with our inner child. I'm a registered behavior technician working at an autism therapy clinic, which is really just a fancy way of saying I get paid to hang out with kids. We laugh, run, play, fall over, and win. But the job's not just about hanging out and playing board games. It's about providing guidance, being a friend, being an advocate, and helping these kids in any way we need. The help comes in so many forms, from brushing your teeth to a mock job interview, I've done it all. This job does require a lot of patience though. I've been bitten, headbutted, spit at, kicked, pretty much anything else you can imagine. Now that being said, it is crucial that you know how to react in a situation like this. There are two things to keep in mind when something like this is happening. The first thing is that the child's safety comes above everything else. Ensure that they are in a safe environment and protected, even if that means protecting them from themselves. That's because some children during challenging moments will engage in self-injuring behavior, or SIV. The SIV can come in the form of biting, scratching, hitting, or in extremely challenging moments, biting down on your hand with as much force as you can, or hitting your head on the wall or a nearby object. It is our goal to redirect that into communication and block them from hurting themselves, even if it means I'm the one on the receiving end of the biting, scratching, or hitting. The second thing to keep in mind is they're trying to tell you something. That something can be as simple as, I need a break, I'm hungry, or you beat me at Uno, now I hate you. But they're trying to tell you something. If the kid wants to beat me up, so be it. My plan is, I'll stand there, I will not react, but I'll occasionally say something like, do you need a break? Is there anything I can get to you? And as soon as they stop engaging in that behavior and tell me what they need, I'll fulfill that request and to the best of my ability. Within reason, um, there is a kid when he's really mad at me will say, I want you to leave. And to myself, I'm thinking, well, like, yeah, me too, but <laughs> I'm on the clock, you know? <laughs> I think one of the reasons that I'm a good fit for this job is because I'm the baby of the family. I'm the youngest brother of two older sisters who would put me in dresses and I would be the guest of honor at their exclusive tea parties. And um, growing up, my sisters would always have friends over and I was always hanging out with older kids. I'm sure as we remember, nothing makes you feel cooler than hanging out with older kids. As a teenager, I found myself working as a coach, a camp counselor, and a swim instructor. In a weird way, without knowing it, I was always preparing for this job. Fast forward to college. I'm a psychology major with really no idea what I was doing in my life. All I knew was that I would be screwed if I didn't go to grad school. One day during class, our professor comes in, says that another professor is going to come in, advertise a job in our company. No experience required, working with kids, part-time, chance in career, I'm in. I immediately sent my application, and the next thing you know, I'm in a full interview outfit, sitting at a child-sized plastic chair, at a plastic table, conducting my interview at our clinic. Three years later, I've received the award of most valuable behavior technician at my company, and I plan to continue on in the field of grad school. <laughs> but we are far from where we need to be in the field of autism, and nor am I an expert. That's because autism research is very new, and yet somehow still outdated. There are wrongs that must be righted, as well as the ridding of problematic concepts and phrases. In order, in order to learn what's best for these children, thoughtful, ethical, and considerate research must be conducted. We must listen to these families and hear what they need. This is a world where we are given the chance to change lives for the better, but it must be done with care and consideration. We must listen. We have parent meetings where we sit in and listen and see what the parents have to say about what they would like to see 
anything we may have noticed, or anything else that may have came up in any way that we can serve them. As time goes on, more and more families will need our help. The CDC reported one in 150 children diagnosed with autism in the year 2000. In 2018, that shot up to one in 44 children. It is crucial that the right people step up to give these families and these children the care that they deserve. And supporting the families is so important because at the end of the day, the families are at the core of the child's support system. By supporting the family, we can support the child. I'm privileged to have grown up in a family where I was allowed to always be myself. From painting my nails to dyeing my hair blue, I was always going through phases. That translated into me getting tattoos and piercings as an adult, and to be honest, still going through phases. Now, why does that matter? Why would I talk about that? It matters because it teaches the kids something really important. That something is, you never really have to grow up. The kids seeing someone who doesn't look like maybe how their parents look, or how teachers that they see every day doesn't look, speaks volumes. It shows them that they can always be themselves and express themselves however they want to. There's also something beautiful and heartwarming about the kids treating me like anyone else. They don't see a giant dude with tattoos and piercings. They just see their friend Sam. And it's only right that we do the same for them. We should treat others how they want to be treated. And everyone deserves the right to express themselves. Now, I'm not sure why, but for some people this isn't the norm in my line of work. But treating the kids like anyone else is so important. Children with special needs already have enough going on in their day-to-day -day lives to make them feel as if something is wrong with them. In school, they get pulled out for speech therapy, another class, there's meetings with psychiatrists, and no matter how discreet a parent may be, they will hear themselves being talked about. And that's why it's so important to give these kids a safe space to be themselves. And the best way for me to lead by example is to be transparent and genuine with who I am. Not being said, I talk to the kids how I talk to you guys. I call them dude, bro, I make sarcastic jokes, and if we're playing Monopoly, I'm gonna try my hardest to win. Because I already told them to buy the railroads. But like I said, there's merit to why I do this. It gives the kids confidence and social skills. And like I said earlier, Nothing makes you feel cooler than hanging out with older kids. It shows the kids that they can always be themselves and they can always have fun. Plus, it's hilarious hearing kids pick up on your lingo and sometimes even start to talk like you a little bit. I have a kid I work with, let's call him, I don't know, Ted, for example. <laughs> Ted and I are playing an entirely made up game as eight year olds love to do. As he very poignantly explains to me the rules and intricacies of this made up board game, he stops and he looks at me and he goes, do you get the vibe of what I'm trying to do here? <laughs> now, that's hilarious for a lot of reasons, but I've never heard an eight-year-old use the word vibe correctly. <laughs> and that just goes to show you that's why I do what I do. These kids are learning confidence and social skills, learning to be themselves, learning to joke around, learning to play. Plus, we are no longer in this world where children are silenced. The idea of do not speak unless you're spoken to is long gone because their voices matter, and it's time we listen. Now, where does this leave us? Why am I talking about this? This really isn't the most lucrative field. There's a really high turnover rate, a lot of stress, and a myriad of obstacles to overcome on a daily basis. And that is why it's so important that the right people are doing this job for the right reason. At every single work meeting, event, or training, there's someone who makes a point to remind everyone there what the job is about. The kids. This job's about being their friend, being their ally, being their advocate, and leading them to success. Being an ally for someone who feels like no one in the world understands them speaks volumes. We do what we do because we want to see the kids do better. At the end of the day, that's all that matters. There's two things I want you to get out of this talk. The first thing being, Please educate yourself. Educate yourself about autism, how to be an ally, how to be a friend. Listen to autistic adults about their experiences and what's best for them. The autism community needs more people on our side, so once you are educated, educate others. My last thing being, never grow up. 
Never lose touch with that inner child. Never stop being excited by things. It's never too late to change. Get that haircut you wanted. Change your wardrobe. Rescue that dog. Our identities aren't fixed, and we can express ourselves however we want and choose to start doing it whenever we want. Because at the end of the day, we're all just children with different shapes and sizes trying to figure out what we're doing in this world. Show compassion and respect for others, and treat others how you want to be treated. Thank you.